are saying. That's my kind of you know core definition. And so we looked, we pop, we profiled. There's, there's some some of the organizations that are leading in this area self-profiled their work. We looked at a really fascinating movement in an article by one of our co-guest editors, Elizabeth Christofferson from the Rita Allen Foundation. She took a look. They do a lot of funding in the area of what's called civic tech. So this, all this innovation in, in new communications technologies, which are being used to enable citizens <coughs> to uh, be more uh, easily uh, challenging or, or monitoring uh, public services and the like around the world. Articles on methodology, a piece on epistemology, which is one of my favorites. If you guys haven't read um, that piece, I really recommend it to you. You'll learn why kettles are not chickens. And um, uh, another great piece looking at the relationship between constituent voice and, and kind of formal experimental research like randomized control trial studies in the social space. Um, uh, looking at the learning discourse and what is what does feedback contribute to, to learning and how does what's the going on there and when do we learn and when don't we learn and how does that land in organizations? We looked at analogs like medical research, very interesting article. Looked at the politics around this in a couple of different articles. Jay Naidu from uh, former trade union leader from the anti-apartheid era in South Africa and then a minister in the Mandela government wrote about, in a sense, the politics of citizen voice. Um, so it's pretty good, I think, uh, uh, coverage of the, of the landscape in that way. Um, so trends, uh, I, I think it was, we, we, we located this movement toward constituent voice, this emerging practice. We located it in the long historical journey of democratization and that it's now finally landing in the practice of organizations that are um, trying to solve important social problems. And you know, you might say, well, wait a minute, that's what social organizations have always done, and that's why they exist, and they're there to help people, and they therefore, why do they need to be democratized? And uh, my experience working now 35 years in development around the world is that while we mean well and we do listen, we haven't developed that rigorous practice of systematically listening and landing it in information that can be then used to hold us to account and can be used to deepen the engagement. And so uh, the, the, the reason that we use the language of democracy, and we say that's what democracy means in social change organizations. But there's another shift which is more geeky and more kind of management speak which is the shift that I think is larger than constituent feedback to which we fit in, which is a shift toward what I like to think of as a more evidence-based, iterative approach toward management, toward doing our work in social change. And that means relying on real-time data to validate what you're learning and to, and to learn in a more structured way, forming hypotheses, almost like adapting the scientific method, forming hypotheses going out and trying things, looking at the evidence of coming in and either validating that or not. And what constituent voice does, Caroline referred to the fact that there's a range of different kinds of evidence that we want to look at in this <coughs> uber shift toward a more evidence-based approach. Qualitative feedback data is only one, time, one kind, there's diverse kinds. And so it comes in and it fits alongside and you can use it to cross-tabulate and kind of reality check what you're seeing through other data. But what I think is most important about it is that it's a form of engagement as well. So that when you ask people what they're seeing, you might go to them and say, look, this is what we're seeing. This is the data we're collecting. Um, what do you make of that? And so what you're doing is you're creating a dialogic process, a conversation that's about social learning. And you're, everyone is moving ahead in that way. So, that, so you're moving from a kind of an organization-centric view to an ecosystem or multi-constituency centered view of information and management. And I think that's the big shift that we're part of. Um, so what did we find? I think we found a, a vanguard. And uh, it's, it's a broad vanguard. It includes funders, it includes implementers, it includes researchers. They're all represented in the issue. Um, and, and I like to, uh, we, a group of organizations came together about 18 months ago that 
come care about this and form something that we call Feedback Labs. And it's basically just an open house and you're all invited to, to come along. We have every eight weeks or so we have a gathering in, in London of Feedback Labs that started in Washington. And it's essentially at this point just a kind of a rolling symposium where we come together and talk about the challenges of taking feedback seriously. Um, but that group has formulated a, a, a kind of a mantra, which I'll share with you in, in my conclusion, which is um, we want to do, that the doing feedback systematically is the right thing, the smart thing, and the feasible thing. It's the right thing for all the reasons that we, we, we know. It's the moral thing to do as, as one of the responses to this issue has, has, uh, has said very well. Um, it's smart because it improves your impact and effectiveness in multiple ways. And it's increasingly feasible because the costs of doing it come down every day with the new technologies. Um, and so uh, that, there's, our, there's my kind of elevator pitch mantra that you could take away. I'll stop there. Um, okay, thank you, David, for a good summary. In fact, actually, what I, okay, I think now I was going to say, could you talk a little bit more about the niche as opposed to the other things, but let's come back to that. So I want to ask Nina now. So as I said, Diffid is, is one of the early adopters of this, of the constituent voice methodology, and I'm sure amongst um, government development agencies, certainly the first. Um, no? Um, okay, um, anyway, whether or not the first, I want to ask Nina, so, so why, uh, why are they doing it? Um, what are they hoping to get out of it? And what exactly are they doing? And you know, what have you learned so far? Great, thanks, Carolyn. Um, it's, yeah, it is a pleasure to kind of be here as part of the, this breakfast. Um, I mean, just to clarify a little bit in terms of, of where DFIT comes from on this. I mean, for us, you know, I, so my role is um, I'm the policy lead on beneficiary feedback. So for us, you know, constituent voice and that methodology is one part of a much larger area of work, which is looking at how can we strengthen the way in which we use beneficiary feedback across DFID programs. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the bigger work and then talk a little bit about what we're doing specifically on constituent voice. Um, so I think when you look at um, an organization like DFID, there are a few contextual issues that are relevant. Um, one is just sort of the size of the beast. Um, you know, DFID is an enormous organization um, and is effectively a wholesaler. You know, so we are actually quite, quite far removed from our beneficiaries because we're working through multilateral agencies, through implementing partners. So we're a few steps away. So for us, it's really about looking at how, how the intermediaries use beneficiary feedback. So that's, I think, one important point. The second point is, is something that sort of David mentioned a bit, which is International development has a long history of participatory development. So I think we, you know, even though we're now sort of talking about constituents' voice in the context of you know, democratization and all of that, in international development there is a kind of a firm ground of this kind of language. So I think that's that's an important note. Um, I think for DFID itself, I think there's another development that's useful to kind of think about contextually, which is that. In the last couple of years, um, there's been a, a kind of a big organizational shift in DFID, which some of you may be familiar with, which is we did an end-to-end -end review looking at sort of different business practices and kind of came to the conclusion that sort of we've got these big books of rules and processes and decided that that was really sort of keeping us back from being innovative and adaptive. And so what they've instigated a couple of years ago was something called the Better Delivery Agenda which meant that we shifted from a big book of rules down to 37 rules, which is, which is pretty small for an organization of our size. And the idea there is that the, we're putting more emphasis on sort of the judgment and professionalism of our staff to be able to decide what to do. And that's a, a big part of that is about kind of being a learning and adaptive organization. Um, so I think that's, for us, sort of gives you a sense of contextually where we are. Um, in terms of how we're thinking about beneficiary feedback, um, there's a few areas. Um, I think the main, the main thrust of it is really kind of what, what David had said, which is you know, how do we use the voices of our beneficiaries to improve the quality of our programming? Um, and I think that's really at the heart of it, is about how do we use beneficiary feedback to make better decisions and to encourage our implementing partners to make better decisions and have better results. I mean, that's kind of 
the beginning and end of it. Um, so you know, we're not particularly prescriptive about how it's done, but it's really the principle of why it's being done. Um, so the first area that we're really looking at is it's kind of a whole area of work around program delivery and management. Um, and this is sort of very kind of the nuts and bolts of how do we look at integrating beneficiary feedback into our terms of references, the way we contract our partners, the way we evaluate our partners, the way we design programs, you know, really all of the, the bits and pieces that go into developing sort of large-scale international development programs. And that's to be honest, a lot of what, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the second area of work is around um, in the humanitarian sector. And this is, um, many of you may know, there's, there's a big movement around accountability to affected populations. Um, and there's a real push in the humanitarian sector to ensure that we are accountable and responsive to beneficiaries. And this is an area in which I think DFID is really keen to push the envelope. Um, there's a World Humanitarian Summit coming up next year. And we'd really like to see strong language there about all development partners doing humanitarian work to be really strong on their accountability to affected populations using all sorts of beneficiary feedback tools. So that's a, a second <coughs> area of work that there's a lot being done. Um, the third area of work um, is around um, organizational learning. And this is how DFID itself thinks about how we do our work and how we're getting feedback. Um, and so here we're actually doing some work with, with David in Zambia, looking at using the constituent voice methodology to, to get a better sense of how DFID is perceived um, in country. Um, how do our key stakeholders, sort of the partner government, key implementing partners, other donors, how do they perceive working with DFID? And how do we then take that information to improve the way in which we do our work? Um, and then also part of that methodology is within our programs, seeing, at, seeing how our implementing partners are perceived, seeing how beneficiaries sort of perceive implementing partners and perceive DFID. Um, so it's, it's very sort of it's a very new piece of work, um, but it really comes from sort of the thinking within DFID leadership about how do we become a learning organization and how do we genuinely sort of step back and think 